Today we're celebrating Juneteenth, so I got my homegirls with me, Ari Chambers, Dee Dee Richards, and Chelsea Miller, the journalist, the athlete, and the activist. For those of you that don't know, Juneteenth is a holiday commemorating the end of slavery in the US. So let's talk about it. What I really need to know, and we'll start with you, Chelsea, is when did you first actually learn and know about Juneteenth? I would say years ago, just because my major in school was politics, specifically American politics and understanding that. And so for me, I already, I always knew about the history, but I think understanding how it's connected to what's going on today, understanding that larger narrative, that's something that I've learned over time. Quote unquote, Abraham Lincoln freed enslaved people, but we all know that there's always a delayed promise that comes after especially when we talk about the history of america and so juneteenth to me is a reflection of a delayed promise that we've seen a lot and so as an activist it's something that i understand as a part of the history but also the importance of how we even understand what's happening today you know one thing about miss chelsea she gonna deliver with the facts and in the educational background but politics was not my major and black history we had to actually voluntarily choose to learn about it in school i'm from the south so this is something that was very much erased um so my full capacity of learning about it as embarrassing as it is was last year i'm not gonna go up here in front like i knew all details about it until it got raised into question or raised into the light last year when everybody wanted to advocate for black lives and so and again, these are things that we've been marching for for years and years and years. But but, you know, the, the whole Black Lives Matter movement and the trajectory it had last year brought a lot of historical things that have been buried. That's super real. I, I think a lot of us did. A lot of us kind of maybe had heard of Juneteenth, but really didn't fully understand the history up until last year as we see this big push. What about you, Didi? Being from the South, Texas, we literally didn't have to learn about it. And it was wasn't the fact that we didn't have to learn about it, but they literally gave us a week for Black History Month in Black History Month. I didn't really get to know about it or really feel that I had to until last year when it was brought to light and the W kind of shed so much light on it. So I kind of felt so like dumb or like, you know, rude and uncultured, um, so to say. Yeah, and I think, I think for all of us too, it hurts, right? Not knowing about our history, especially because, you know, we've known about July 4th our whole lives, right? And Chelsea, I want to get your thoughts on Juneteenth versus July 4th. When we talk about independence, when we talk about talk about freedom, we talk about this understanding of that, we realize that historically in the US that this has only been applicable for a certain group of people, right? When you talk about everything from July 4th, Declaration of Independence, Boston Tea Party, all of these things that white folks did as a way to gain their independence in that same way when you talk about in 2021, the fact that there are black folks who are fighting for their lives and the way that that is demonized, but then you look at history and then we have American heroes right and so who do we decide to choose on who are heroes why do we decide to applaud them right and so for me when I think about July 4th I think that it is a warping right of history and patriotism and all of these things which of course is important to how we understand nationalism self all of those things yes that has a place in our history but i think there's also something else to be said on like how do we understand juneteenth how do we understand the fact that there are still people who are fighting for these rights there are still people who are fighting for their rights for independence for freedom for justice for all of these things within our own country right and so i think it's a it's two different narratives and i think it's important that we shed light on the fact that they're all connected and then similarly for juneteenth as a way to say we need to do more learning of our history because that's important too um and so juneteenth is also a celebration of black joy we did a juneteenth celebration out in new york last year we're doing it again this year listen google is free but chelsea miller does it better <laughs> that's all i gotta say and and you talk about New York, Chelsea, we see uh, Louisiana making a push. We're seeing more and more cities starting to make a push. And especially with someone like you, right? You, you're doing the work every single day, right? So how do you take care of your mental health? 
When I think about my mental health, it's really important for me to continue to center myself. I always say that you can't show up for the world without first showing up for yourself. And so taking that time to reset, taking that time to set boundaries, I think that's so important because this work is designed to train us. This work is designed to tire us. And so it's so important that even in the midst of that, that the best form of resistance is self-care. And that's something that I talk about a lot. The best form of resistance is showing up in the way you need to show up as an individual so you can show up for your community even better and a lot of us too we talk about how juneteenth is also a celebration of black joy but also black women feeling like they constantly have to be on and Didi, i want to take it to you um do you feel like we always have to be on especially when you see someone like naomi osaka take a break from the french open for sure um like malcolm x said the most disrespected person in america is the black woman and he definitely hit that one nail on the head when he said that because constantly even now black women in sports so to say we are still fighting for just equality and pay gaps just things like that where we're doing the same sport but just because they're a man in their sport or their field they're considered as better or looked at as higher up than us and it's just it's things that like that that we're gonna cons consistently have to fight for you know being a woman but you kind of get used to it which i kind of hate being a black woman you're used to fighting and you're used to you know, going the extra mile to do what's good for you instead of like people being handed it to them. And I, I've always hated that, but it's definitely something that is going on and will continue to happen. All right, the most disrespected person in the world is the black woman, okay? And for you, when you hear that quote, what does it mean to you? And, and how do you kind of take that on in your everyday life? It, it's, it's funny, cause I hear you mention Naomi and I hear Dee Dee's frustration and I see how Chelsea always has to uh, activate in the community and it, it is a lot of pressure but I wouldn't want to be anything but a black woman we're built with a certain level of resilience that shouldn't be um, undervalued underestimated I don't think people underestimate us at all I think they fear us and I think that that's where that lack of protection comes from like oh she's strong she'll be all right um, but having to always be honest really really an interesting internal conflict that I have for myself because if we're always on we never get to recharge and just having to depend on our sisters and sometimes our brothers but just knowing that the world isn't built for us doesn't I, I don't like to focus on that because I do know we're built with a strength that a lot of other people can't really uh, understand or relate to a, a sense of resiliency that you, people can only dream of so I take pride in it um, I take pride in knowing that though the world wasn't built for us, we are actively working to make it better for our kids and our community as a whole is going to keep us stronger together and afloat. And I think that's beautiful. Like I look to my sisters, I'm, I'm marching next to you, Chloe, and you're bringing me out to these marches and I'm seeing Chelsea, I'm seeing Mia, all of them just like activating. They're so young and, and so powerful. And I get chills just thinking about what black women mean to the world. And without us, I don't think the world would function the same. It just wouldn't. For a lot of us, we are the only ones in the room or we're trying to bring more and more people with us, which is huge. And you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the quote that when you occupy spaces that aren't meant for you, sometimes being you is just the revolution, right? So we're all trying to navigate the spaces differently. And I want to add to that, Chloe, like, um, Chelsea always is like, you know, we shouldn't get comfortable and we always can do better. But I want to add what my mentor told me is like, don't be satisfied with being the first or the only. So though we are a revelation in ourselves, um, pushing to break those boundaries and occupy those spaces with more of us will have us more empowered um, to make a change and, and our voices uh, be heard that much more. So that's what I would say to the people out there. Like if you can be in a position where you can get your sisters and brothers heard, um, there's more empowerment in that than being the first or the only that's like trying to really push down these barriers. If you have extra hands, is again, that's the strength and community aspect. That's great, all right. And we'll swing it over to you, Chelsea. What does true allyship look like? Because to me, I feel like the word ally was probably the most overused word in, in 2020, but how can people actually show up for you, specifically if it's white friends, white coworkers, how can people actually be a true ally? 
historically taking a look at some of the greatest injustices that have ever occurred and people say oh yeah well i was an ally okay well what did you do how did you create change how were you a part of shifting the tide and so if you can't answer that for yourself then no like you are not actually a part of the movement you are not actually supporting the movement and so a lot of what organizers have been saying over these past few months is that you know we're not looking for allies we're looking for accomplices because I think that then shifts it to the accountability piece on what are you doing and how are you showing up. How do you think that people can continue this momentum and that we don't lose sight of it as the world is opening back up? Like Chelsea said, putting the, the activity, the action behind your activism is a thing. So now we're beyond the, the stages of, hey, talk to it amongst yourselves because everybody knows it's going on. At first we were dealing with people just really being ignorant to the fact racism exists. We're past the fact that it exists. We see it on social media. We see it everywhere. Um, it exists and, and you need to take it upon yourself if you want to, to join in on this, um, to put some action behind that. Don't depend on your black friend to explain you her experiences all the time. Sometimes we're too tired to even talk. We're too busy marching. We're too busy living it. Um, but just really taking it upon yourself to be like, how can I make it better? What are the steps that I need to do to, to push you know, society forward as a whole so that it can be a situation that is comfortable and livable and peaceful for people of color, for black people, for black women, for other marginalized groups. And, and Ari, that's a great point. And, and it brings me to another topic too is um, when we talk about culture vultures, right? Um, it's funny because right now I'm actually wearing Walker wear um, designed by April Walker, based in Brooklyn. She did stuff with Aaliyah, Tupac, uh, Biggie, Method Man, all of that. And she has this shirt and it says um, ghetto until proven fashionable, right? And so we've kind of seen the rise of do rags starting to become mainstream, right? Um, not just black people wearing do rags, we're seeing white, we're seeing Asian, we're kind of seeing um, a little bit of everything. So when you hear the statement, uh, when you hear the statement ghetto until proven fashionable, what what does that mean to you? And we'll start with we'll start with you, Dee. Dee. I feel like that's almost the same as you know how they normally say guilt i mean innocent until proven guilty i feel like with us is guilty until proven innocent and i feel like that's literally piggybacking off of that and it's the same thing with just being a black person you walk outside you're wearing something and it it makes everybody's head turn because of just who you are as a black person like me i'm constantly wearing crop tops it's considered sexualized as a black woman but if i'm walking by a white woman then they are considered in, in style and it's never fair but it's again something that you kind of get used to being a black person yeah i know my friend Brittany. actually a couple years ago she was a journalist uh, on air talent um, for a local news station in i believe alabama and her her case actually got national attention because her news station was saying her protective styles were inappropriate um and unprofessional and i just encourage people to really dig down and see why it's deemed unprofessional what is the problem with like you know we, we are embracing our natural hair like this is me like on camera all the time um no matter what i have my bamboo earrings i have my natural hair i typically have a red lip and thank god the people i work for are very accepting and nurturing of me presenting myself how i want to but Black people should never have to second guess, hey, will I not get this job if I present myself fully me? I want to challenge people why it's so offensive when black people present themselves fully them. <laughs> like literally cultural norms, when you talk about everything from, you know, box braids to baby hairs, to like that being fashionable now, but when black women do it, it's seen as quote unquote ghetto. But as soon as a white celebrity wears it, it's like, wow, what is this new thing that's going on? It's like, actually, it's not new. It's just imitated. There's difference. So what I will say to that is that I think we consistently need to unapologetically show up as we are. I think we need to unapologetically take up space. And one of the things that I tell my friends, one of the things that I tell other black women in my circle is go where you are celebrated. And so when there are places that are trying to make you small, 
find other places where you can be as big as you want to be because i think that you know when we dim our light to make other people comfortable then in doing so we lose ourselves and we lose our history and we lose our authenticity and the truth is it's that same authenticity that they will then capitalize off of and so no we're reclaiming it and i think that we're in an era of reclaiming it everything from our sexuality to our bodies a shout out to chloe bailey yes ma'am you know and so i think that it really it really we've seen it across the board and so i think that we need to continue to do that and push back against those beauty standards those social standards and show up unapologetic and so that's what i do yes yeah, so chelsea you hit that right when we talk about kind of the nails the do-rags kind of everything that that black people do and wear starts to become in style starts to become fashion dd said it and i feel like it's so exhausting for people to constantly code switch right because when people show up to work right sometimes well most of the time a lot of people don't feel like they can truly be themselves and when i say a lot of people i specifically mean black people and to take it a step further black women so with that being said what makes us happy where do we find joy where does that kind of all stem from whether it be at work is it key cam with your homegirls when something at work happens where do we find joy for me my joy comes from existing in my duality i think that it's really important for us to be able to navigate the world as we are i always say that you can stand michelle obama and also stand Meg the Stallion, you can love to twerk, and you can also love to be an activist. Like all of these things can exist. And I think that it's really important that we don't try to box ourselves in or try to use labels as a way to show, you know, especially black girls, that this is who you are or who you can be, but rather give them all of the examples and all the multifaceted natures of how we exist and how we show up in the world so that they know that they can be, right, all of those things. And I think that's really important. And I think that especially for black women and girls, the ability to exist in all these different spaces that is our power and that's our strength no like going along with chelsea uh, in addition to the duality alignment is really really special um and it's it again it might be a privilege but just knowing that you can step into places where you will be celebrated where you will be seen as an innovator a change maker and you'll be welcomed in that same breath is really really super important too i'm fortunate enough in my life i don't necessarily have to code switch so my joy comes in you know my everyday action i'm looking at people in front of my screen right now who bring me joy on a daily like chloe you're one of my lifelines and so just being able to just kick it and do I can't say hood rat shit. To do um, really, really fun things with you guys running around the city is just, it's just fun for me. I think what brings me joy right now is seeing like my other black friends succeed. I'm at like this point in my life where you're graduating college and you're, you know, doing your own thing. You kind of leave your friends, and it's like when you're seeing your black friends or your black, you know associates kind of succeeding it, it brings joy to me or it makes me happy and makes my heart feel warm but other than that then just being around my teammates that i feel like in the w like we're predominantly black and so like we're all around each other and the w does a good job at showcasing everything black and everything lgbtq and you know it's just making everyone feel kind of included and i've always loved everything about the w and the inclusivity that is kind of brought along with the whole w WNBA constantly shows up for the LGBTQIA plus community, but how can everyone else show up for the black LGBTQIA plus community? I, I saw a quote the other year that said, if you are for black rights, but not for LGBTQIA plus rights, then you want privilege, not equality or not equity. And that's so real. You we have to continuously protect, especially if you're gonna say black lives matter. I know we got into that that situation we were like all black lives matter and so that includes your trans sisters and brothers that includes your lesbian and gay um friends and family that includes the bisexual range because i think a lot of times bisexuality is a race too so just showing up in the same way you would want your ally or your co-conspirator to show up for you um being active and speaking out on behalf of the community um activating, putting intention behind your activism, um, figuring out the history of it, educating yourself is, is the first thing. Like I know now we're coming into gender identity and in placing emphasis on pronouns and things as little as 
You would, you would be shocked. As little as respecting people's pronouns that people can't seem to get under their belt, um, that's a way of showing like, hey, I stand with you. I understand you. I see you as you and I respect that. So, I mean, start there. If, if, if nothing else, start with the proper gender identification. Stop erasing bisexuality. Um, figure out how to advocate for trans lives because they're getting, they're lost at an alarming rate. So just being, putting that same intention behind that community, the LGBTQIA plus community, as we are with Black Lives and marching on the forefront for that, um, and really meaning it and wanting better for the community is a way. But my people ate and left no crumbs. You already know my homegirls always put on Chelsea Ari Didi. I just want to thank you so much for coming on, and I hope everyone goes out and celebrates Juneteenth. So definitely, everyone, come out to Juneteenth. We're going to be in Brooklyn this year again taking up space, I'm in there. celebrating black joy, all of that. And so it's important for us to show up for that part of our history. So definitely come outside. <laughs> Pull up, hop out. Me and Dita, not gonna even lie to you, we'll be in LA. Is that where I'll be? Like, is that where I'll be? Dita, I'm here talking about period. You, you gonna be in LA.